All right, so we're going to pick up right where we left off last week, where I was talking about primary keys. Um, or actually, I was talking about keys in general, and I had to hit the point of talking about primary keys. Um, a primary key is a way to uniquely identify a row of data. This really sounds familiar to last week. Essentially, in the school here, your student number is your primary key. That one number identifies you to the school. It identifies all your attributes tied to one identifier. And primary keys are really important in a relational database. And I'm going to expand on that last point. As most of you have realized, I use the slides more as a memory aid than an actual reading the slide. Yes, they're used to make sure there's relationships between individual records. But it also does one other thing. It makes sure you can actually pull up unique records. So let's say we had a database and we had um, a stack of students in there called Mohammed and Mohammed. I'm picking on the Mohammeds today. Why? Because I once had a class with four Mohammed Mohammed Mohammeds in it. First name Mohammed, last name Mohammed. And there was four of them in one set lecture section. Now let's say Dan wants to pull up one of these students from the database, and I don't know their student number. I got to search by name. Can you take a guess how many Mohammed Mohammeds are in Algonquin's database? Not going to work. Student number, on the other hand, identifies the specific Mohammed I want. That's the importance of a primary key. It lets you uniquely identify things so you can operate on them. So when a primary key is chosen, database lookups are fast and reliable if you did it right. And that should say some hints, not some hits, but sure. Keep it short. The shorter the primary key is, the faster the lookups are going to be. Ideally, use a number, which is point number two. Um, so when you're querying a database, Searching on text is slower than searching against numbers. Later in the term, I'm going to be talking about indexes, and this will make way more sense when I'm talking about indexes later. However, if you need to search for my last name in the database, that means, you know, G-A-U-D-R-E-A-U-L-T, 10 characters. That means that it's got to go through every key, looking for all those 10 characters, comparing. And of course, computers aren't that smart. When you people says, oh, yeah, I'm comparing the whole string, you do realize that's not what the computer is actually doing, right? It looks at character number one. Is it the same? Look at character number two. Is it the same? Until you hit all 10. And it goes, this is a match. Now, let's do that across a million rows. On the other hand, if you're looking for a number, I want number 500. Numbers are numbers. They're not subdivided. It doesn't go, give me a number that starts with 5, followed by 0, followed by 0. It literally asks for 500. The database knows how to find 500 because it's a whole unit. Maintain simplicity. Avoid putting in weird crap. Spaces, mixed case, special characters. Why? Because it's going to slow down the searches. And especially if you start getting clever and you start shoving in uh, miscellaneous other languages other than English in the database, some languages occupy more space than others. Chinese, Japanese and any other uh, Koreans like that too. Anything that uses what they call multi-bytes for characters, whereas a Latin language uses one byte per character. A occupies so many bytes, B occupies the same amount as A, C occupies the same thing as A. With languages that use multi-byte, one character might be one byte, the next character could be four. The, the fancier you get, the more bytes it needs to compare, the slower it's gonna be. Once you've created a primary key, do not change it. You can't change your mind. You're committed. There's no going back. Why? Because you have to actually destroy the original primary key to add a second primary key. And in the meantime, you could screw up the data. 
Therefore, don't do that. If you need to change the primary key, you actually create a new table, copy all the records into the new table, and then drop the original table. That's the only way to change a primary key safely. Take it from someone who's had to do it both ways. Take my advice and just, you know, do it the safe way. Yes. Okay. When you need to create a primary key, like if you need to replace a primary key, what you're going to have to do is create a new entity, copy all the data into the new entity, and then safely drop the original entity. And then you rename things so that they still work. It's a real pain in the ass. Uh, either one is not safe. Uh, one is safer than the other. Um, you know, one is like changing the tire on a car while it's rolling. The other one is like, you know, putting on the back of a tow truck and changing the tire while the tow truck's driving. You know, one technically is safer than the other. Are they good ideas? No. The only way to do it is to take it completely offline, which is like taking your car to the garage. Most systems, you don't get lots of offline time. Um, primary keys cannot be duplicated. They must be unique. Just like everybody in this room, your student number is unique to you. Nobody in here has a duplicate student number. It can also not contain null values. Have you guys been taught about nulls yet in your programming class? Okay, so a null, nulls are actually more important in database even than pro regular programming. Nulls is the absence of value. It's not an empty value, it's the absence of value. So picture it like Schrodinger's box, right? Schrodinger's cat, the box is there, it's defined. You don't know what's inside of it because it's never been opened. Therefore, the inside is undefined until you open the box. Now, there could be a cat in there or not, who knows? But box is defined. You don't know what's in it because nothing's ever been put into it. The second you open the box, air gets in. Now it's an empty box. You drop a cat in there, now the box has a value. So that's the three states you'll see in a database. And that is a null, empty, or not empty. Primary keys cannot be null, and they cannot be empty. But they definitely can't be null. Because you can only because null is an absence of value, therefore. You can't search on absence of value. Well, you can, but it's not very trustworthy. And a primary key can be defined at the table level or at the column level. This is going to be for later. Uh, that point's kind of besides the point. Um, essentially, when you're creating a table, you can define the primary key as part of the column or as the table as, as a whole. It's just a chain of difference in syntax and functionality. But in the end, it's the same result. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to get to surrogate keys. So last week, remember, I was talking about not using real-world items like social insurance numbers or SSNs or email addresses as primary keys because they can change, they're unreliable, et cetera, et cetera. The right solution to that is what they call a surrogate key. A surrogate key is an... I hate the word artificial column. It's a column that has no real world meaning. So thus it's artificial. It is populated automatically by the database. That means the programmers don't need to set any values. The users don't supply any values. It's all automagical. It is numeric, thus it's short. It will never change because it's almost like a lap counter. And I don't know if anybody in here has ever done sports where you actually run and you got the person counting laps as they go by, you know, click, click, click. Or if any of you have ever done the job, sitting there counting cars going by. Fun job, by the way. You just sit there listening to music and every time you see a Ford, go click, 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 click. And these count, but once you've used that number, it can never be reused. So one, two, three, four. It can never roll backwards. The values are artificial. It means it's meaningless to end users. Doesn't mean end users can't learn to use them. 
It just means they're meaningless. A perfect example of that is an order number. We've all ordered stuff from Amazon. If you actually noticed, look at the email, there'll be like an order number across the top and it's just a bunch of numbers and dashes in them. It means absolutely nothing except to the database. Often it's hidden. People don't see it. The, one of the rare cases where you see it again is, for example, an order number, or in your case, your student number. That works. Now, here's a sample of a table structure called rental property. And you'll see that there's a street, city, state, province, zip, postal code, country, and rental rate. In the original one, They've got underlines under street, city, state, province, zip, and postal code. And that ends up being a compound primary key. So you need all these pieces to be populated to be able to find that one record. On the other hand, if we create it with a surrogate key, we give it a property ID. The rest of it are not part of the primary key because you can just find it using that unique ID that was given to it. Now, why would... Why would this be better than this? What happens if you've got three rental properties or you're renting out three rooms in one place? You know, like student housing that you see down on uh, baseline. Those, you know, fancy looking apartment buildings they built. And uh, in here, you can see that there's nowhere in there to allocate a room, but you could actually have three separate entries in here because you've got three separate property IDs. Those are things you can do with it. Also, if you're trying to find a property, you only need to know what the ID is. You don't need to know the rest. And I just literally finished talking about this. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what would happen if, you know, somebody's typing in and they go 1187 123 Street and the other one's 1188 and Dude's not paying attention, and so they, they pull up the wrong one because they're typing in the wrong thing for searches. Yeah, he's right about that point. Is With the surrogate key, there's less likely to be search errors if you're searching for the unique IDs. Because, I know, it is what it is. And a composite key is a key that consists of two or more columns when it's used for a primary key. That should have been before the surrogate key talk. This is a compound key. It's a key made up of a bunch of different values. They're slow. They are difficult to use. They make programming complicated. They're not your friend. Yeah, yeah, instead of the surrogate key, this top one up here is using what they call a, co a composite key or a compound key, which means that every single time you want to update the rental rate, you actually have to search the street, the city, the state province, and the postal code. And let's just say we do a lease agreement. To identify the lease agreement, you've got to copy this, 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 and this into the lease agreement on top of the lease agreement's unique ID. That means that lease agreement's primary key is going to be like huge. It's automatically generated. Five. Yeah. Um, I am not a fan of composite keys, as you can probably tell by now. Um, because they're gross to work with. Honestly, modern database design kind of frowns upon using composite keys anyways, specifically for the reasons I just mentioned. I mean, for example, with back to this wonderful example here, let's just say we've got this table structure and suddenly we need to add a unit number. So we're going to throw on a unit number as part of the primary key. And now every record must have a unit number. And the second one here is literally this. Well, this, in this case, the primary key is a surrogate key. In this case, the primary key is a compound key. Ah, there we go. Light bulb. I love the light bulb sound that people make. I usually at least have one, one per term that makes light bulb sound. It makes me feel happy. Hang on. And now we've lost, there we go. <laughs> now, foreign keys. So we talked about primary keys. It's what we use to uniquely identify 
a record in the database. Student number is a primary key. A foreign key is a attribute or a field in a table that derives its value from the primary key of another table. Okay, I know that sounds like a really big mouthful, but I'll explain in a second how it works. Essentially, it allows you to link two different records together. A good example of this for you guys that you guys can, you know, relate to, and that wasn't meant to be a pun, that just came out like that, is class section, right? You guys are in section 300 of 8215. In section 300 of 22 fall, 8215, there will be a couple of different keys in there. There is a course ID, a prof ID, and probably another row for a student ID, which is your student number. And then you got your student record. That means the student record can be associated to many course sections by copying the student number into the course section attendance list. I'm simplifying the structure is actually more complicated than that, but we're going to go with that concept for now for you know ease of understanding. So essentially the child table has a field in it that is known as a foreign key. Its value is set to the ID of another record somewhere else. Another example of this would be, um, well, Amazon orders are a good example. You don't see it, but I guarantee you've got a unique ID somewhere in Amazon land. Um, if you've bought anything from Amazon, you've got a unique ID somewhere in Amazon line, land. And every time you place an order, that order is given a copy of your user ID so that we know those orders belong to you because it has your user ID in it. Is that clear as mud? Vaguely understandable? Like if I had a piece of paper here, I'd use these two guys as my example. Uh, but essentially you could picture it as I got a piece of paper, I write down my staff number on it and I give each of them a copy of my staff number. That means now that they are my children. Don't want to be that, but they're my children and I become the parent record because they've got a copy of my staff number. If I were to remove the staff number from them, they'd still be existing. Now they're orphans, which is bad. Nothing against orphans. It's just orphans in a database is bad. You don't want orphaned records because then you have no way to find them. So, that's what foreign keys are for, is to make sure that the data in the database is pro properly linked to each other so we don't have abandoned or orphaned records uh, so that we can look things up quickly. For example, if they know your student number, they can find out your course section number by looking up what courses you're enrolled in by punching in your student number into the course listings. They'll know. The system's designed to pull up those records. Yes. Okay. I'm missing the last word. My brain's tired. Yeah. No, you guys are the foreign keys. I'm the primary key. So the prof table, my employee ID, student table, foreign key is prof ID. My ID gets copied into your entries to identify you as my students. Okay. All right, so I covered the first point in better detail than what's there. Um, basically, it's called a foreign key because the value comes from a foreign source. In other words, the value in that table, in that field is not native to that data. It just belongs to something else. Thus, it's the value is being pulled in from the outside into that field, thus it's foreign. 
And if we look at this example down here, we have department, primary keys, department name, budget code, office number, department phone. We have an employee number, last name, first name. And in this case, they're putting the word department as the foreign key. Its value would actually be department name because it's getting that from here. And this is straight from the textbook. And it's again showing student number coming from the student table, the class number coming from the class number. Remember a minute ago when I was using the analogy about the class section? There it is in pictures. You've got the student number, you've got the course number. In here, you've got the combination of student class number. Both of these are foreign keys. And in this table, in this case, it actually becomes a compound key combined of student and class number. Not how I design it, but you know the, the example brings the message home. And this is the exact same thing again. And so is this one and this one. So many pointless slides in these decks. OK. Um, in Access, that's what they look like. We're not going to use Access to this course. So this diagram is kind of pointless. But it shows in a diagramming tool of some sort, you will see how the student number populates the grade, the course, the class number populates the grade table. And this becomes part of the primary key. So these are foreign keys and part of the primary key. So the primary key is made up of two foreign keys. So this is a compound key that's built up of two foreign keys. And if you don't understand, please interrupt me. Just because I'm on a roll doesn't mean I can't stop. Yeah. No, it's a bunch of fields together that makes up a primary key, not a bunch of primary keys together. Well, usually the compound key is the primary key. So you'll have multiple fields in a compound key. If it so happens it includes foreign keys, fantastic. It could possibly not include foreign keys. In this case, we're talking about fields. Rows is a combination of, like a combination of all the columns put together. In this case, I'm just talking about raw structure, not the data inside of it. Can you speak up just a little? Yeah, it's compound key. So it's a, it's a couple of different pieces of information, a couple of attributes, a couple of fields, whichever word you want to use. When you combine them together, it allows you to identify that row uniquely. Thus, it becomes a key. Same thing. Composite key, compound key, same thing. Synthetic key, surrogate key, same thing. It depends what textbook you're reading. It depends on when you went to school. Words come in and out of FAD. Some of us have slightly different terminology because we have different backgrounds. But it's basically all the same thing. Composite, compound, surrogate, synthetic. The only thing you don't need to worry about is primary key because they're all primary keys. OK. When should you not use a key? Now, there is this data scientist called Cod. His last name was Cod. I wish I could remember his first name. I'm drawing a complete blank. Uh, but he basically defined, he's one of the founders of something called relational algebra. Uh, if you were going to university and you were in third year or fourth year of university, you'd be learning about relational algebra. Somebody created an entire field of mathematics to describe how things are related to each other. And it's not like, you know, oh, it's like one chapter. I, I saw the book from Cod. If the book is this thick, that much of the book is relational algebra. And I fell asleep about three pages into those chapters. Uh, I decided I didn't have the math background to actually understand it, which is fine because I just need to know how to use the database. I don't need to understand what's happening on the inside. 
So a relation as defined by COD is the rows of a relation must be unique. Now, again, that means that a collection of all the columns or fields for a specific entity must be unique. There is no requirement to designate a primary key. Technically, if you can guarantee that the entire row is going to be unique, you don't need a primary key. But the fact that you have to say the entire row is unique, it implies the need for a primary key. So realistically, every table or relation must have a primary key. So when do you know when or not? When to use or not to use a key? The answer is always use a key. Pretty straightforward. Okay, now we're going to get into terminology that lets you do lab two. Yay. Uh, you guys are lucky. You're getting an extra week to do lab two. Some of the other groups aren't getting that extra week because of they had their lectures in the week one. I bet the coffee drinking is going to sound awesome on my recording. It just hit me. Okay, entities. So up till now, we've been talking more about physical attributes, right? Talking about primary keys, compound keys, and foreign keys. But before we get to the physical attributes, we have to understand the concepts that lead us there. And the first concept is an entity. An entity is something that can be easily identified and that someone wants to track. I hate the word users here because it's not always the users that want that data tracked. It could be someone else. But basically, somebody wants to track some information and basically what defines it is an entity. So when we talk about, again, the school student information system, there is an entity in there probably called student. And we're talking at a high level now, not the actual structure of the database. There is an entity called student. There's probably an entity called instructor, an entity called course. These are things we want to track. It can be a person, could be a thing, could be a time, could be an event, could be basically any describable thing. It's a thing. That's all there is to it. It's a thing that you need to track. And there are two phrases tied into this. Uh, there is an entity class and an entity instance. An entity class is a collection of entities of a given type. So going back to students, my entity is student. My entity class would be everybody in this room. Putting all of you together in a box, is an entity class. We have a collection of students. You are an instance, and you're an instance, and you're an instance. And apparently one with his hand up is also an instance. No. No. You can refer to one entity from another entity, but you cannot compound entities. It's not Java. Yeah, it's like a two-dimensional array. But, you know, array is something that probably 90% of this room have not learned yet. So there's no point bringing it up. I'm not picking on you, I'm just saying, you know. However, it's basically an entity is like a spreadsheet. All the rows put together is the class. Each individual row of the spreadsheet is an instance. So th this is just pure definition. But it's an instance. So usually there's many instances of an entity in an entity class. And honestly, we can substitute the word entity class for just entity. It's basically the same thing. The, for lab two, one of the tasks is to identify the entities. Right, you're given two different descriptions, two different ways, and it asks you to identify the entities. And then you're going to define the attributes, but for now we're going to talk about the entities. So these are the things 
that you want to track. So the objects in the description. So that could be as much as simple as a, an employee or a pet or a client. Those are things you want to track. Those are entities. Person, place, thing, or event. In other words, it's something. And that thing can be a person, a place, an event. Heck, man, it could be the weather. The weather is what? It's a thing, it's an event. You know, it's actually a combination of things put together when you think about it. So, yeah, so an entity is a thing you want to track. That's part of what Lab 2 wants. And we got an example on the screen. We have a customer entity. The customer is made out of a number, name, and an address, uh, and a name for the person, and an email address. And then we have two instances. So the combination of all these pieces of information combined makes up a single instance. This fits into that structure. Ditto for this one. This fits in that structure. So you put these two together, and you have an entity class. The entity class is defined by the entity, and these are individual instances. Kind of clear? Yep. No. Each entity is, at least in a database, um, in a relational database, except for a very specific few products, they don't allow inheritance. Therefore, they are standalone, separate thing. It's as if I referred to the two of you together as a single thing. That's not how that works, right? So you're an instance, he's an instance. You're not a compound instance. There's no such thing. So entities versus tables. The principal difference between an entity and a table, also known as a relation, not relationship, a relation, is when you're talking about entities, you can define the relationship between entities without using a foreign key. Because we're doing this, it's at the design level, right? It's at the concept level, not at the physical level. So that means you can say, prof, student, they're related, good enough. With tables, we actually have to say, Prof ID, student ID, prof ID, that's how they're connected. At the table level, you have to say how they're connected. At the entity level, we just have to say they're related, good enough. You don't need to describe how they're, they're related, you just say they're related. So it makes it easier to work with entities in the earlier in the design process. It makes it easier for um, developers to explain things to their no, to their clients, to their managers, because you can use very simple diagrams to explain things to them, as opposed to complex diagrams that has a bunch of technical mumbo jumbo in it. If you're just explaining to a customer that, hey, we're gonna track your customers, their orders, the, uh, the products they've ordered. The customer will grab that, they go, I get it. On the other hand, if you say, okay, we're gonna have a customer table, an order table, an order lines table, a product table, uh, price lookup table, shipping method table, blah, 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 blah. They're going to look at you and their eyes are going to glaze over. Um, and they're just going to stop listening. So when you're doing the initial design phase, you can explain to them fairly easily by just describing the entities. So when we're talking about entities and there's attributes, there is three words that get used or three phrases that get used. There is identifier. It's the attribute that distinguishes an entity instance from every other instance in the system. Now, if we're talking about students, and before we create a surrogate key to identify you, also known as your student number, we have, um, we'd have to try to find something that could potentially be used as a key. So those are identifiers. In other words, it could be your phone number, it could be your name, it could be your name plus your phone number. Now, it could be a bunch of things. The primary key, we've already described that ad nauseum. It is the unique identifier that is chosen at the end. The candidate key, which we also described last week, 
is the potential key set of keys that identify a person. So this could be a combination of person's name and phone number, their you know social security number, or social identity, your SIN number, your SSN number. It could be any of these things. Um, those are candidate keys. They may turn into a primary key, or you may decide not to do that at all and just use a uh, surrogate key instead. Attributes, which is part two of the lab. So I'm also explaining to you guys how to do the lab while I do the lecture. So attributes. Attributes is what's used to describe an entity. All entity instances must have the same attributes. And the next two points I'm actually going to cover in a bit. I'm just going to skip them because I'll be talking about them. But that's the stuff you need for lab three. Um, but when we talk about instances and their attributes. So you have an entity. The entity has attributes. In this case, let's go back to the student entity because you know at least that's something we all can understand. You have a name, an address, a phone number, an email address, and some of these uh, some of these attributes are required and some are not because not everybody has, you know, two different address lines, that kind of thing. However, when we are populating the instances, every student has the same set of attributes. The values in the attributes may be different, but we have the same attributes for every entity. In other words, every single student must supply a phone number, a name, an email address, you know, some sort of unique identifier it could be your SIN number, passport number, student visa number. That stuff is required to define you. And every single one of you will have the same set of attributes, if you will. Whether or not they're all populated is not the same thing, but every single one of you will have the full set of attributes. So over here, like this talks about the ellipses and the rectangular form. So an employee is an entity, the circle, the ellipses or the ovals are the attributes. This is when you're doing a conceptual diagram. This is a basically the entity in a, a logical diagram. So you've got the unique, you got the, the entity name, you got their attributes going down. And in this case, we also identified a candidate key. Over here, we've got it identified here with an underline. This and this are the same thing, just so you know. So when we're talking about lab two versus lab three, lab two is taking, I'm going back a ways, something that looks roughly like this. That's what you want to do for lab two. It's right. It's like this different syntax I'm asking for, but it's like this. On too far. Lab three is taking that text and turning it into this. And I will be giving you guys links on tools to do it properly. I got two hands. I think he came, his came up first. I'm not sure. Yes. And when you do it as a box, it goes like this. In this case, it's the, well, in this case, this is conceptual diagramming so these are candidate keys once but basically they might as well be a primary key but they're candidate keys in this case yes yes yeah now and there's two ways you draw it when you do it you'd either do it as separate items with underlines, or you put them all in the same bubble, common limited. I've seen it done both ways. They're both acceptable. It's just, if you're doing something like that, one example where you had five pieces to the primary key, they're not gonna fit in the bubble. So you end up having to put them all in with the underlines instead. So this is the entity. These are the attributes. This is the entity. 
everything inside the box is the attributes. So this and this are, are conceptually identical. This is the um, conceptual diagram. That's the logical diagram. It's the only difference between the two. Yes. No, you'd, that, that'd be pointless. This, in this case, is probably a Sturgit key, yes. Right, if there was no employee number, then we'd have to probably do name and phone number combined to make it a compound key to uniquely identify them. Why? Because you could have two people with the same name. Or you could have two people with the same phone number. Not unheard of. Nepotism exists. I'm not going to talk about nepotism in the workplaces. Never dealt with that. All right. Why are we doing identifiers again? So on the previous slide, the employee number is the identifier. It's basically it's an attribute that is used to uniquely identify an instance. And breaking down that previous slide, if we could actually draw it three different ways. You got just the employee for just the entity without the attributes. We got an entity defined like this with just the identifier, or you get the fully described version. There's just different flavors of the same thing. Um, depending on how complex your diagram is, often you'll want to collapse this a little bit because there's so much noise. Um, like for example, one of the databases at my day job sits at 300 tables. Let's just say 300 tables and there's way more columns than this in it. At the diagram, last time we printed it, it because we have large format printers, so we get to print them on you know 48 inch wide paper. I, it took the wall from there to you know the first landing of the stairs, and the tables were that big. So four foot long, ten foot wide diagram, and that's because the one of our customers asked for a physical printout of the database structure. We're like, why? Why? Sure, there you go. Are you going to pay us for it? Yes. Okay. I'll just send that out to the print lab. They'll get on that right away. So now we're going to talk about relationships, which is that, yeah. Well, it could be a compound key of the employee number and their phone number. Or maybe we have another identifier that's not the employee number because maybe we're bringing in a legacy system. So we have another surrogate key in there and the employee number is just leftovers from the old system that gets populated automatically. The identifier becomes a primary key. Right? It's just like the difference between you're a student, you're not a graduate yet. You're just in a different stage in your school career. Okay, relationships. I just want to check my time. Fantastic. Okay, relationships. So relationships is a way of tying two entities together. And relationship classes is basically all the relationships between one table and the other table. An instance is a specific relationship. So to make it clear, there is an entity called professor. There is an entity called student. There is multiple relationships between the professors and the students because I could teach multiple courses. You guys are obviously taking more than one course. Therefore, those are the relationship class. That, in other words, all the connections between these two entities. A specific instance would be me teaching you in this class. That's an instance of a relationship. The class is the general description of the relationship between the two. A relationship can involve two or more entity classes. In theory, you could have multiple entities related to each other at the same time. It's not that complex a concept. If we go back to the student example, instead of being a direct relationship between the student 
between the professor and the student, we have a course section. The course section is an entity, but it has multiple relationships. There's a relationship to the profs, a relationship to the student, a relationship to a course, maybe a relationship to a program. So that is a relationship class that has multiple parts to it. Um, by the way, relationship class, whether it shows up on the, the, uh, the tests or not, that's a phrase you almost never hear. It's basically a relationship between entities. All right, so we have the degrees of relationship. So there are several degrees of relationships. And somewhere along the way, somebody decided they needed to label them. So a relationship between two entities is known as a binary relationship. Why? Because it's got two. Three entities has a ternary relationship. And then you go four, five, six relationships, and they suddenly just gave up on the concept of giving it names. There is a type here not listed, which is also known as a unary relationship. That's a thing that is related to itself. Um, I'll be talking about that more during the design class about things related to themselves. Uh, but often it's used in category lists. You know, each category can have subcategories and that subcategory can have subcategories, but technically they're all categories. So they're all related to, to themselves. That's known as unary. So an example of a binary relationship, an employee is related to a skill. It's known as a qualification. A ternary relationship would be a client, an architect, and a project are related to each other. And I guess they decided in this case to call it an assignment. These are, by the way, these things are just labels. They're not industry standard descriptions because, you know, you could have something that's not an employee and something that's not a skill, then it wouldn't be, you know, for example, an employee could have a project that has nothing to do with qualifications. That would be assigned, you know, assigned work or something. But essentially, this is a binary relationship where one entity is related to another entity directly. And that means what we're talking about is specifically the connection between the two entities. Employee could be related to something else. But this relationship is a binary relationship. In this case, this is a ternary relationship where three things are connected together. If back to the example of the student, you got a student, you got a prof, you got a course, that's a ternary relationship, and that's probably defined by some other thing. Yes. Or five or six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yeah, someone somewhere along the way they insist on naming the unary, binary, and ternary, and then they go, that basically anything more than a ternary is just known as greater than ternary. I wish I was joking. You just have this, a diamond, aligned back to itself. Well, no, because the employee is not related to itself. The skill is not related to itself. The project could have tasks below it, and the tasks could be a tree because it could be a, a task that has other tasks tied to it. Then you'd have, you know, possibly a unary relationship below the project. That's just not shown on here. Unary relationships are actually pretty rare. They're a very specific use case, whereas binary and ter ternary tend to be a little more common. Okay. All right, database integrity. I swear to God, I pre-read these slides. I shouldn't look confused when I'm looking at them. Um, we have defined three constraints so far in the discussion. We talked about, um, we haven't discussed about anything about integrity. So, I'm trying to remember why this slide is here. Let me go look at the next one. Yeah, so this here, we haven't defined any of this yet. We're going to be defining it the next slide. Slides are out of order. 
The purpose of those three kinds of constraints is to create database integrity. That means the database will contain useful, meaningful data. And the three are domain, entity, and referential integrity constraints. And now I'm going to define those, what those are. So domain integrity constraint. It's the requirement that all values in a column are the same kind is known as a domain integrity constraint. For example, a good sample of that would be, well, they're using first name here. Sure, we'll use that as the example. So a first name is a domain. There's a rule that says that everything going into the first name attribute or column must be a person's first name. You cannot put their date of birth. You cannot put their address. You cannot put, you know, their phone number. The rule says it must be the person's first name. That is a domain integrity. That is to ensure that all the data going into a specific entity or table is clean. That it follows the same rules so it is predictable. Now, you may have different entities or relations that have the same column names. For example, you have a student entity, there's a first name. There could be an employee entity which also has a first name. Even though they're two different entities, they may have the same domain constraints or similar domain constraints, I should say. <clears throat> An entity integrity, entity integrity constraint is the requirement that defines that a primary key must be unique. Okay, we already talked about how primary keys must be unique. So the entity integrity constraint means that the primary key must be unique. There cannot be um, a completely null row. In other words, a row cannot be empty. Otherwise, it breaks integrity rules. It's as if you, I'd say, I'm going to create a student, but the student does not exist. But, you know, we created a student, but there's nothing to define the student. Doesn't make sense. And then referential integrity constraint. This is the hardest one. So it basically says that any value in a foreign key must exist in the parent table or parent entity in their primary key. So should be the primary key. So a value in a foreign key must exist in its parent table. You cannot put a value in a foreign key that does not exist in its source. Um, a good example here would be, I'm going to register my non-existent student that's full of nulls into this course. There's no student number, so how am I going to register them in the course? Because I can't put their student number in the foreign key because it doesn't exist in the source record, because the source record does not exist. That is known as referential integrity. The values in a foreign key must exist in the parent record of the parent table. You cannot use a non-existent value in a foreign key. It's a pretty straightforward concept once you think about it a little bit. You can't call someone if they don't have a phone number. That's basically what it amounts to. All right, now we got cardinality. Cardinality stands for account. And it's expressed as a number, but it's not any number. And it's not even really a number. They like to use the word number. So there's the maximum and the minimum cardinality. So that means that the maximum cardinality is the maximum number of relationship instances an entity can participate in. So we got a relationship. The minimum number of cardinality is the minimum number of relationships an entity must participate in. Did you notice there's a difference between the word can and must? Here's the perfect example for you, all right? 
to be a student in this course, the minimum cardinality would be many students, one course. So the, the cardinality is usually described as zero, one, or more. Zero, one, or many. So the, the M stands for either more or many. So zero means it's optional. So in other words, a student may or may not be registered in this course. So you could be theoretically a student at the school, but not registered in this course. So the minimum cardinality student to this course is zero. The maximum cardinality is many, because there could be zero, one, or more students in this course. If, on the other hand, I turn it around and say, the minimum cardinality is one. That means that this course cannot exist unless there's at least one student registered. Or I should turn it around and say, you cannot be registered as a student unless you are tied to at least one course. Because you're, you're, you could be technically a registered student, but not an active student if you don't have any, if you're not taking any classes. Therefore, minimum cardinality is either zero or one. The maximum cardinality is one or more. Zero means it's optional. One means you it must participate. That's the minimum. The maximum is one or more. If it's a one-to-one -one relationship, which is actually really rare in database design, especially modern database design, that means that a student can only ever take one class. That class is only ever allowed to have one student. A waste of resources and money. But theoretically, it could be done. A maximum cardinality means that this course can have many students. Each student can be registered in this course once. So that's cardinality. Does that make sense? Generally? Kind of? Okay. Looking for hands before I move on. Moving on. Parent-child entities. I've been talking about parent and child for a while now. And I think you've probably got the idea by now what parent and child record means. So, essentially, when you have a record that has a one-to-many relationship, that is a parent-child relationship. A parent record can have many child records. A child record can only ever belong to technically one parent. We're going to go back to our Amazon orders. You place an order on Amazon. You're buying three things. Amazon's not the best example, but we're going to roll with it. You place an order on Amazon. There's three things in it. The parent is the order. The three things in your shopping cart are the child records, right? So each of those things in your shopping cart belongs to you and only you via the order. So for looking at the example, an employee can have one or more computers, but each computer can only be assigned to a single employee unless you work in a call center. <laughs> uh, but for example, how many of you have more than one computer at home? How many of you have more than four computers at home? How many of them actually work? Right? On the other hand, each of those computers at home belongs potentially to you and only you. Same idea. Got a hand. I uh, maybe. You got a question or you're just saying yeah? Yeah. Okay, you're just participating. Okay. Now that's an example of a one-to-many relationship. You have many computers, but each of those computers belongs to you. You're the parent, the computer, or your children. Your, your electronic spawn, so to speak. That is a parent-child relationship. Pretty straightforward concept, I think. I can go back and use Loblaws as my example. Got your shopping cart, grab some bananas, grab some bread, 
Grab some peanut butter. I guess you're having peanut butter banana sandwiches for supper. You get to the shop to to check out. You check it out. You pay for it. At that point, those three things belong to you. And the relationship is you have a receipt. Each your receipt has three items on it that prove they belong. Your receipt is one thing. Each of the items in your bag are the child or the children of the receipt. Foods are usually a good way to get people to understand things. And maximum cardinality. I already explained this. Wow, these slides are so out of order. Um, I was planning to go over this yesterday, but you know, 12 and a half hour days, that was nine o'clock last night. My brain was, students are gonna have to suffer. Okay, maximum cardinality, I already explained that one. So you got one to one, one to many, and theoretically many to many. By the way, many to many is bad. You don't create many to many relationships in the final database. It's impossible to do because database servers don't let you do many to many. There's ways to resolve it, which I will be teaching you guys later. But I refer to the many to many relationship as the Kentucky relationship. If you don't get that reference, please ask someone who did. The Kentucky relationship, ding, 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 because they're all related to each other. There we go. Most of you have got it. Those of you that didn't get it, just ask someone who's smirking. They'll explain it to you. So in the database system, the one you'll see the most is one to many because that's the most common one. One to one has special purpose uses. Uh, they're not actually very common and they're actually kind of frowned upon because all you're doing is making the database more complicated than it needs to be. Many to many is great at the concept level because we can say there's a many to many relationship in this class. I may have many courses, you guys have many courses, thus we're related via many-to-many -many relationship. That way, realistically, once we get down to the nuts and bolts of it, you cannot do that in a database. You actually have to build other things to make that happen. So again, an employee and a badge, that'll be a one-to-one -one relationship. I have one badge. One badge is assigned to me. You guys have a student card. You have one student card. That student card belongs to you. That's one to one. Um, employee and computer. It's the same thing as you and your computers at home. Employee and skills. So an employee will likely have multiple skills, and it could be that there's multiple employees with the same skill. So if you're talking about a computer company, like a software development company, you might have you know, employees that have skills in Java or C++ or SQL. You'll probably have multiple employees that have knowledge of C++. So multiple people have C++ and a person has multiple skills, that's the many-to-many -many relationship. Is that kind of clear? Does that make sense for the most part? Hand. Can you, a little louder. Okay. Which one, the many to many one? Okay, so we have a company. Pretend we're all employees of this company. And all of you at this point in time have a base set of skills. Some, let's go with this half of the room are programmers, this half of the room is database guys. Just because it happened to be that the programmers have C++, the database people have SQL, but there could be some that have both SQL and C++. That means that each of you, each employee could have one or more skills and that skill could be assigned to one or more employees at the same time. Thus, an employee has many skills and each skill may have many employees. Therefore, once you say many on both sides, it's a many to many relationship. I'll, I'll explain it later. Yes, it's totally solvable. It's easy to solve. And I'm going to maybe solve, explain it in this slide. It's probably, if it's not in this slide, it'll be the next set of slides. I know it's not going to be in this set of slides. There we go. So <laughs> we've not caught up to last week. 
And how much, how on time am I? Oh, just a little behind. It's cool because I'm answering questions. I don't mind being behind because we padded extra time towards the end of the term, like the end of the half of the term for stuff like this. Okay. A slideshow from this slide. Okay. So week three is about data modeling. So remember so far I've been talking about entities and attributes, tables and fields, instances and records. Before we get to that, we actually have to do some modeling. This is where we get to draw pictures. And this is where um, the database field sells itself on one of the few things that it has that no other field has than computing. Creativity. And by that, I mean database design is organic. Unlike other things that are very set, you're going to do a call to the database server. The code you're going to use to call that database server is going to be the same in whatever language you're using. So if you're working in Java and you're using something called JDBC, then steps to call the database will be the same regardless of how many times you do it. If you're doing it in Python, the call will be the same regardless where you do it in your program, the calls will all look the same. It'll be a little bit different, but the technique is the same. Data modeling, on the other hand, is organic. It's one of the few spots where your knowledge, your life experience, your ability to think, your ability to create will mold the, uh, the result. Computer programming is like building a house with bricks. Database design is like planting a garden. One comes out different depending on who does it. If you've got a bricklayer laying bricks, can pretty much guarantee as long as they're equally qualified, so that brick wall is going to look the same because they're all using a set way of doing the job. So, in data modeling, it's a method used to document a database system using something called an entity relationship diagram, also known as an ERD. And there is three classes of ERDs, and we'll get to those in a bit. Uh, but essentially, the ERD defines the structure of the database. It is a what they call a strong expression of the organization's business requirements. In other words, the diagram will reflect how the business wants to maintain its information. Data models used for many purposes includes conceptual, logical, and physical, which are the three types of diagrams. Um, of entity relationship diagrams, there's three kinds, and that's the conceptual, logical, and physical. I've been using those words on and off for the last two weeks, and now we're actually going to define what those words mean. Essentially, the ERD is a way to document and help explain the structure of the data and the information to the database and the analysts, the software developers, uh, whoever is interacting with the database, they can look at the diagram and actually understand what the data is, how it's interconnected, and how to use it. Um, I'm sure in your Java course, your profs have been haranguing you about documentation. Uh, comments, comments on everything, right? The comments explain what your code is doing. An ERD explains what the database is. Not what it's going to do, it defines its existence or at least in a way that a human can understand it. Yeah. It, the ERD defines the structure of the database. So, you know when you do a good old DNA test, you know, the 23andMe, and you get this little picture with all the little bars on it? That little picture identifies you. It identifies what makes you. An ERD is basically the picture of the DNA of a database. It basically defines the structure of the database, how it's put together, how it's described, how everything is interconnected visually. Once you're actually interacting with the physical database and the database has been created and you don't have an ERD, 
you end up spending an awful lot of time exploring and trying to understand how things are put together, especially if the database is not well designed. At least if it's not well designed, you can still refer to the ERD to understand how the heck it's put together. So a data model is a plan or a blueprint for the database design. I think that's pretty straightforward concept there. In other words, you got a picture, it tells you how the database is assembled. Um, a data model is more generalized and abstract than a database design. So yeah. if we're going to describe the difference between a design and the model, we can go back to people that build houses. A data model is that nice little concept sketch. You know, they'll draw, sketch out a house really quick and say, yeah, that's what your house is going to look like. And then they're going to take that, turn that into blueprints. The blueprint is the database design. The database model is the sketch of this is what we think you want. The model is what you start with and you end up with a design. Um, a data model is easier to change than a design. Why? How many of you, uh, pretty much everybody in here has seen a blueprint, right? Do you guys know what a blueprint looks like? Now, which one would be harder to change? A quick little sketch of what a house looks like or the actual physical blueprint where you suddenly say, oh, look at that, this toilet bathroom is not up the code. The toilet needs to move three inches to the left. Right, so why the sketch is easier because who cares? You know, ah, oh, the toilet's there, I'm just gonna move it over a little bit. Yay, in the sketch, but it's not a formalized document. That's not a formalized structure. So it's easier to change the model. And normally you start with the conceptual database issues first. So a data model is also known as a conceptual design. So remember earlier I was talking about an entity is used at the conceptual stage. A table is used at the physical stage. It theoretically, is a stage in between called the logical, where you go, you know, concept to logical, logical to physical. And essentially, you got the, well, I just literally listed them. I didn't, wasn't even looking at the slides when I listed those three. So the data model, we're going to talk about in this remainder of today and probably the start of next week is the conceptual des design. The conceptual design and the conceptual diagrams has the following pieces to it. It includes all the important entities and their relationships. No foreign keys, just an entity and their relationship. Not sure if my camera is going to pick it up, but you know, too bad. That's a conceptual diagram at its most basic form. It's this is basically known as a, concept, a conceptual ERD. It has entities and a relationship. Notice there's no attributes on there yet. So in a regular conceptual diagram, you have that. You have the entities and how they're connected. And in an extended conceptual diagram, you will have attributes. Extended. Yes. There are, pardon? Yeah, they're similar. Yeah, it's bringing all those little bits and pieces to one place. So, believe it or not, till now the content actually does build towards a crescendo of content. Uh, it just takes a while to get there. Um, so, 
at that point, what I just drew on the board is now what's known as an extended conceptual. It means that it has the entities, their attributes, and the relationships. You will notice there are no primary keys. A conceptual diagram does not have primary keys. You may put in candidate keys, but it does not have primary keys because we don't know what they are yet. Because we're at the concept stage. Yeah, any attributes on the relationship, that's it. That's a conceptual diagram. So, you know, for lab three, that's what lab three looks like. Actually, if you look at the submission guidelines for lab three, I actually have a picture. It looks like that in there. It depends. If you're lucky, they're going to give you something like this to explain to you how things are related. But odds are they're going to give you a physical diagram and you're going to just going to have to dig through it. If you're really not lucky, they're going to give you the database. And go, have fun! Um, the number of times I've been given the database versus been given a diagram is uh, too many. Whenever I have a junior at work, I try to give them diagrams as much as humanly possible. Uh, why? Because diagrams are easier to understand. Okay, logic, yeah. Yeah, if we had identified a potential candidate, let's just say for some unknown reason we're going to be really dumb and we're just going to use the phone number, that's now a candidate key. It may become a primary key, probably won't be a primary key, but at this stage we can identify that as a potential candidate. As in, we think this is what is going to be unique. Yes. It's still a conceptual diagram because it's a candidate key, not a primary key. Right? A candidate is during the concept stage. Conceptually, a student doesn't have a student number. They have a name and a phone number and an email address. Logically or physically, they will be then given a student number. Somewhere along the design process, somebody came up and says, hey, this is kind of dumb. We have, you know, 10,000, 11,000 level one students this year at Algonquin in Ottawa. We can't just refer to them all by name. I bet you there's duplicate names somewhere in those 11,000 people. Okay, so a logical diagram, which we are going to just speak about quickly, is a, remember in the previous slides where we had like the little box with the field names inside of it? Yeah, so let me just grab a different colored marker that's still going to show up well. If we were going to do the, the logical one, we'd go stuff like this, and this is still the candidate key. fact, realistically, it'd be drawing with a different syntax. We'd be using something called crow's foot, like this, but I'm going to be talking about that. Let's pretend we are going to use the person's name as their unique identifier, which I've kept talking about how stupid that is, but for you know, illustration purposes, it's perfectly acceptable. Yeah, it shows the cardinality, which I will be talking about crow's foot at some point, I think, today. If not, it'll be next week. So the logical diagram has every piece there. We have the potentially the primary key defined. So it's actually, I shouldn't have put the CK, it should have been PK. So once we get to the logical stage, we have the primary key defined. 
Uh, foreign keys will be there. So if we talk about the foreign keys, suddenly in here we include uh, as a foreign key because it's defined. But uh, so as we slowly build up the logical diagram, we take this really vague one on the right and we're slowly adding details to it until it's all the relationships are defined, it's been normalized. That is much later. Normalization happens in like two weeks, um, time permitting. So we have the primary keys defined, the attributes are all defined, the entities have names, we know what the relationships are, we know what the foreign keys are. That is a logical diagram. The physical diagram is the logical diagram plus data types. Um, I'm assuming by now, week three, your Java class probably has started talking about data types. Yeah, Whew. there, I don't need to explain data types. But in the database, everything has a data type. We actually have more data types than Java does. Uh, depending on your database engine, you will have anywhere from 25 to 50 data types to play with, minimum. There are some primitive ones, known as primitive types, which are basically shared across all database engines. Character fields, varying length character fields. Those exist in both worlds. I'll explain those, I think, next week. Booleans, integers, floats, long text, date, date time. Those are primitives. Every database system offers you at least these. More powerful database systems will include all kinds of other nifty data types for you to play with. Uh, the database engine we use at my day job, we use one called PostgreSQL uh, because it's free yet it's powerful. It offers you data types such as IP address. And you can actually search by octets against a specific IP address. It offers ge geometric types. You can have a data type called circle. What does it contain? X, Y, R. And now for those of you that don't remember your geometry class, X, Y is the center of the circle, R defines the radius. That's all you need to define a circle technically, right? Where is it on the piece of paper and how big is one, how big is it from center to the edge? That's a circle. There's another type called uh, rectangle. It provides you X1, Y1, X2, Y2. Giving it four digits allows you to actually store a rectangle in the database. And by the way, a square is also a rectangle. Um, other types it has, um, I've seen types for XML, I've seen types for JSON, I've seen types for pretty much anything you can imagine. They've got types for that. Oracle, similar, Microsoft SQL, similar. My, MySQL has its own set of data types. It's got some pretty unique ones, but they're, you know, special. Um, so when we're creating a physical diagram, it looks just like the logical one, except there's data types tied on. I'll actually be going through that in a week. So I'm not gonna get into too much detail today. Uh, sometimes you, the logical diagram should be fully normalized, but then you get to the physical side and you suddenly realize, wait a minute, I need to unnorm denormalize my database structure. I'm using words that I haven't taught yet, but that's okay. You end up denormalizing it because, you know, performance requirements, blah, blah, blah. Um, and sometimes there's physical considerations that'll make the physical diagram be quite different from logical, rarely, but it happens. Um, and the physical database diagram will be different for every database server. The logical one applies to all database engines. The physical one is tuned to the engine. So a diagram for MySQL may look similar to one for Oracle, but it will be different because they have different data types. Like in MySQL, you have a data type called varchar. In Oracle, it's called varchar2. Why is it called varchar2? Heck if I know. But apparently varchar is reserved for, for, for future use. Whatever. Um, in Microsoft SQL Server, it's going to be uh, varchar or nvarchar, depending on what it is you need to do. Different data types, they do the same purpose, but they have different names. Thus, it's going to be different in the diagram. 
So an ER model is a subset of concepts and graphic symbols that can be used to create conceptual schemas. I just want to make sure I don't run out of time. And extended ER models is extensions by a design, uh, data scientist called Chen. Um, and basically create something called subtypes. Essentially, when we're using the term ER model, we're talking about ex the extended version. So an ERD is a pictorial representation of the database. I said that already, it's a picture. And it serves two purposes. Of course, we can describe the database con concisely and accurately. And an ERD can slowly be transformed into a proper physical schema by taking appropriate steps. Um, in a conceptual ERD, the first one here in whatever color this is, plum, has three pieces, the, at the entity, the attributes, and the relationships. Now, depending on the modeling software you're using, they may use two different forms. Some of them will end up having a form that looks just like a logical diagram. Other ones will use this. Um, data modeling products today commonly use using the rectangular form. That's because their developers are lazy. Because you know, drawing a box and drawing a box with extra stuff inside of it is a lot easier than drawing a box with circles and then changing that into a box with stuff inside of it. This is more old school. This is somewhat more modern. However, there's something to be said about the old school one because it's easier to explain to a layperson. This, you bring up to a layperson, they'll have a hard time really understanding what the pieces are. This is easier to understand because you can say, this is the entity, those are the attributes. They go, this is the entity, and each of those things inside of here is an attribute. This is busier. And we're going to skip cardinality because I literally finished talking about that. That's kind of weird when you go from one week lecture to another week lecture in the same day. We don't need to review those concepts because I just finished talking. Yep. No, no, no. I finished, I just finished week two and I dove into week three. Yep. So parent-child, we already talked about, did this too. Wow. Look at this. There we go. Crow's foot. So everything I just skipped is what I just finished talking about for the last hour. Um, crow's foot notation. Uh, crow's foot notation is used as specific unique shapes and symbols to represent elements in the database. A crow's foot diagram is uses entities as boxes and relationships are lines. It does not have this diamond in the middle. And the different symbols at the end of these lines represent the different cardinality. You know, the one-to-many, one-to-one, many-to-many. And these are the symbols we, we see. So when you're looking at a logical or physical diagram and they're using what's called crow's foot notation, and by the way, it's not the only notation. Because like everything else in computing, somebody comes out and says, oh, that's cool. There's five different ways of doing this. I can do it better. Now there's six different ways of doing the exact same thing. People like reinventing the wheel in computer line because they think they know better. On the other hand, these are pretty much used in the industry as the de facto standard. So we have four symbols at the end of our lines. So remember on my little diagram over on this side here where I've got this line and actually I didn't finish drawing the entire crow's foot, I drew part of the crow's foot. So we've got one entity, we have another entity and we have a relationship. Notice there's no diamond. So we have one end, two end. Each of those ends will have one of these four symbols on it. The very first one means mandatory one. This is saying one, and it must have one. So one must have one. This is saying mandatory many. It must have at least one, but there might be many. This is optional, at least they use a circle for O for optional, right? Optional one, 
In other words, in this case, a student is optionally registered in a single class. The class could exist without that student, but that student may be registered in that class. Optional many. A student may be registered in zero, one, or more classes. That's what that's saying. So this is, says zero or more. It could be one, could be five. This is saying one and only one. They must be registered in at least one, potentially more than one. This is could be one or none. And the last one is could be zero or more. So if we go and take this example we have over here and we convert that to a crow's foot notation, it would end up looking like this. And essentially, an employee is related to a department. So in this case, a department must have at least one employee and may have multiple employees. Each employee belongs to only one department but it may not belong to any department. So the department for the employee is optional. And this is where a lot of people, when you're learning about crow's foot, their brains start having a problem because you look at the department. So you look at the very first symbol right next to it and you think that's the department's relationship. No, this is the department is related to the employee by this symbol. The employee is related to this department from that symbol. Yes. This is a non-identifying relationship. That's for later. Today, we're going to worry about crow's foot, and we're going to stop at crow's foot. Based on my time, we we're probably going to stop very shortly. So when you're reading the crow's foot diagram, there's two no no uh, So the original ER not notation, like this, you'll see that it has one to many, and it has a zero and the one. Originally, this was known as ID fix, ID one F I X. That was the notation it used to be called until uh, I can't remember if it was Chen or Cod or somebody else came up with crow's foot and goes, crow's foot's way better. And everybody looked at it and they go, what's the diff? But you know what? I like yours better. So we're going to just stick to this one. Crow's foot. Not really. I mean, you need to know about the other one for this kind of diagram. For this, no. When we're talking about logical and physical diagrams, you only for this course, you only need to worry about crow's foot. Yeah. Conceptual is straight, simple relationships of the diamond. Everything past conceptual is crow's foot. So just to reiterate one last time, the relationship for a given entity is at the opposite end of its line. So it says this department is related to employees this way, the employees related to department this way. No. For those that might have caught the question he asked, is crow's foot used conceptual? The answer is no. The what? This, this, the one end here? Oh, um, one to n, zero to many. Yeah, these are the same thing. So you got a one to n, zero to many, one to n, zero to n. And this is a many to many relationship. And often when you have a many to many, because they don't want to confuse people, they decide to use N to M instead of M to M. I have no idea. It's just somewhere along the way, somebody decided, you know, we can't put M beside M because that's bad. So we're going to use N to M. Who knows? And then, just let me finish and I'll get to your question. So this is basically a many to many relationship. So it's showing an employee must have at least one skill, may have multiple skills. Each skill may have may be assigned to an employee, but not necessarily be assigned to an employee. And they could be assigned to multiple employees. So it's saying that, you know, not everybody has SQL, but many people might have SQL, but each employee 
has at least one skill, so they might have C++, they might have Java, they might have SQL, they might have C++, Java, and SQL. That's what this means. Okay, good. Um, you know what? Where are we at? Stopping right there. And which is slide 27. Can I bookmark? I wish I really should, could bookmark this. 27. Okay. So before you make too much noise, you can't hear me anymore. Lab two, you have everything you need to finish. You have pretty much everything you need to dive into lab three. Unfortunately, lab two and lab three are due on the same day. That's because you guys didn't have all the content from lab two to do lab three. Realistically, lab three is really easy once you've done lab two because you have all the pieces there. I will send it for a piece of software that you can use to create your conceptual diagrams. It's a website, the registration is free. Draw that IO is iffy. There's one that's actually made specifically for conceptual diagrams. ERDplus.com. I'll put it on the announcements. Okay, let me just stop my recording here and then I'll get to you.